We're delighted to welcome today an outstanding panel of experts uh, that will discuss this and other questions, including which models will best preserve democracy and Tunisian society's role in politics, and which political approaches can Tunisia <coughs> take to prevent us slipping back into authoritarianism? Uh, the answer to these questions becomes more urgent as other states in the region, Algeria, Lebanon, Iraq, to name a few, face similar challenges and the possibility increases that we may be on the verge of an Arab Spring 2.0. Moderating today's discussion is former ATA President Bill Lawrence. Uh, Bill is a visiting professor of political science and international affairs at American University. He has 34 years of experience working on the Middle East and the Africa region and the wider Muslim world and uh, lived uh, for 15 years in seven Muslim majority countries as well as in France. Uh, since 2011, Bill has served successfully, or successively, but successfully success. also, <laughs> uh, as the International Crisis Group's uh, North Africa Project Director, as the Middle East and North Africa Programs Director at the Center uh, for the Study of Islam and, de and Democracy, and as Control Risks Middle East and North Africa Associates Director. Uh, and I also want to give a shout out to our friend, uh, Ambassador Jake Wallace, uh, who certainly uh, can and should take credit for Tunisia's success uh, during this uh, political transition. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bill to introduce the panelists. Thank you, Jerry, for those uh, excellent introductory comments. Um, thank you all for coming today. I have the um, unusual uh, privilege today of not being a panelist on North Africa, but being the moderator which means you'll be hearing my comments in the questions, right? Listen carefully, because I won't be speaking, but I'll be putting things into the questions. Um, we have a uh, wonderful panel today of people with very complementary skill sets, all of whom have worked for years on the Tunisian democratic transition, and two of whom have new articles out, one just published and one coming out couple weeks. in a couple of weeks in Journal Here Democracy. Here it is, by the way, yes. when it's not quite. It is, yes. um, uh, on the problems of the transition now uh, centered around the notion of consensus politics and whether or not consensus politics is the best way for Tunisia to approach its current political issues. Um, and and you'll, you'll hear more about that in a minute. Uh, but we're going to open the afternoon with Mohamed Diahememi, who is a U.S.-based Tunisian political analyst and researcher. Since 2013, he worked at the National Constituent Assembly and the Truth and Dignity Commission. He served as consultant for various Tunisian and international organizations. Uh, Mohamed Diah previously studied mathematics at the University of Tunis and the University of Carthage. All the smart students go into math and science and then they find <laughs> their way back right to, to politics. Um, he's now studying government and uh, social studies at Wesleyan University in Connecticut, who helped finance his trip down to see us today, which is uh, wonderful. Uh, his research uh, focuses uh, on politically connected businesses and labor politics mm. in Tunisia. Um, the format today will be one of Q&A, although they all came with remarks prepared, so we'll try to make that work for you all. Uh, and so the first question to Mohamed Dia is, um, what's going on right now with the Tunisian political transition and following the elections of September and October, why don't we have a government yet? So I guess I have to start since the, yeah. the results of the elections. <laughs> uh, so um, like we were all expected, uh, the main result of the election was a president who doesn't have a political party, but at the same time has a very high popularity with 70% of it's in the second round of the presidential election. But at the same time, um, a parliament that is fragmented, but also has a problem of popularity and public support. Um, the uh, main political party, um, or the political party that got the, the largest number of seats is uh, Harak al-Nahda, um, the Islamist uh, party of Harak al-Nahda. 
uh, the others are from different ideological orientations. Usually people put them in the same box as secular. I don't think we can really put them in the same box as secular. Uh, we can find uh, Harak Tushab, uh, Nasserist with Tunisian uh, uh, specificities. <laughs> Use the Chinese uh, expression. Um, uh, we also have Tayyar uh, Demokrati in the same block, center left, um, and Qalb Tunis, the party of uh, the uh, media and communication uh, businessman uh, Nabil Qarwi. So, the, to translate the Arabic names you're using, Nahd party is the Islamist party, the Renaissance exactly. party, Tayyar Demokrat is the Democratic Current, Current. you'll read that one, Qalb Tunis is heart of Tunisia party. The, if you look at Tunisian election results, you can see these parties and how many seats they got in parliament. Yes, and, and uh, the so last the important is, party yeah. is the uh, party of uh, Abir Musi, I forgot the name, I'm blanking. Uh, which is more old regime nostalgic type of political party doesn't really have a coherent ideology can be assimilated to some form of Tunisian nationalism and they claim that they are representing the continuity of the Dostoyan uh, um, uh, movement and going back to Bourguiba and the nationalist one before the colonization but it's more a party that is not subject to the authoritarian era so Destour is the Arabic word for constitution and we have a whole series going back over a hundred years of Tunisian parties called Distour this, Distour that, Neo Distour, mm -hmm. but it basically means constitutional, constitutional and goes back to this long history of constitutions in Tunisia going back to the 1860s where they had the first, the Arab world's first constitution. And also the first uprising. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <against laughs> way back in the 1860s, yeah. Um, so uh, the result is that the, the uh, <laughs> party that was in charge of the formation of the first government, was the party that got the large number of seats, Harkat al-Nahda, was not able to get enough vote to pass its first uh, government. And according to the new uh, uh, constitution adopted in 2014, uh, if uh, the, the parliament fails the first time to pass uh, the government and to give vote of confidence, is the role of the, of the uh, president to choose a prime minister who would have to form a new team and present it again to the uh, to the parliament, and that's what we have we're seeing today. Um, they have, let's say, a few hours left to give vote of confidence. Maybe right now, as we're talking, yep. uh, uh, the uh, designated prime minister, who was minister of finance uh, and uh, the government of Troika uh, since 2011 until 2014. Uh, is maybe now in, there is a press conference or he's presenting his new uh, team. Um, the reason why they, we had to wait until now it's because uh, Anahda uh, wanted to have a government of national unity, which is also another slogan that has been historically used since the um, since the uh, go first government of uh, Bourguiba after the independence. Uh, and uh, but then but historically the expression served different purposes. So in this current co context, Nahda wants almost everyone to be included in the government, <coughs> uh, including uh, the controversial party of Qalb Tunis, Heart of Tunisia, um, founded recently less than one year ago by Nabil Qarwi, who happened to be some people describe him as the Berlusconi of of Tunisia. Maybe the main difference is that he doesn't have a, a football soccer team. <laughs> he has only uh, one uh, TV network. So he's um, he's controversial because he uh, he is implicated in uh, a case of uh, money laundering. Uh, the case is still ongoing. It, it, there's no. He was jailed before just before the elections. Uh, and also, more importantly, which is, I think, an important fact to take in consideration to understand why the party, uh, why Qais uh, Saeed specifically doesn't want uh, uh, Nabil Qaru to be included in the government, is that he has this uh, lobbying contract with, uh, with the lobbying firm uh, that was headed by a former intelligence officer from, the, from Israel. Um, the documents were not leaked, but published in the... Uh, in the uh, U.S. Uh, FARA Foreign Agent uh, Registry Act website, and that's how the uh, public opinion, new, Tunisian public opinion, knew about it. And there is also another uh, court case against that. So, and he was implicated in the Panama Papers scandal as well, right? In several scandals. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Nahda is attached for some reasons to the idea of national unity because they they don't want to have. 
and Nabil Qarwi or any important political party in the, oppos in the opposition. Um, until a few days ago, or it was actually February 14th, Nahda said that they will not vote for the current government. And as a result, what would happen if the current government doesn't get a vote of confidence, the parliament will be dissolved and we will go to new elections. Almost all political parties at the moment claim that they are ready to go to new elections, but we all, well, we know that not all of them are ready. And uh, Nahda's popularity uh, has been, is decreasing since 2011. They've been losing seats. Initially, they had more than 80 seats in 2011. <coughs> now they have uh, 50, uh, 56 seats, so 57 seats uh, only in comparison with, with, with uh, out of 200 uh, something, uh, seats in total, uh, yeah, 50, 54. 54 seats. Yeah, it's 216 or 17. Yeah, 217. So exactly. 54 out of 217. Yes. Yeah. So, so they don't have a majority, and their popularity is decreasing. So, going to a next to new elections for them uh, and, and would be very risky. Sort of 39 to 29 to 19 percent of the overall. Of the overall, uh, exactly. Um, so. What uh, Qaisis I decided to do when uh, Nahda announced their uh, rejection of the government is that he invited uh, the representative of Utica, the Union of uh, Business Owners, and UGTT in a meeting. And just after that, UGTT again, like they did several times since 2011, played the role of mediator and got in touch with those who were opposing the government. And apparently, the new government. Apparently, we'll get the vote of confidence. So this is so, a Nobel Peace Prize winning Tunisian labor union that figured hugely in the 2011 Jasmine Revolution. Exactly. Yeah. So once again, we'll see the, import, the political importance of UGD. So it's not a simple labor union that is defending the right of workers or identifying as a simple uh, representative of the working class. UGD is identified as a national organization. They claim a legitimacy to... Uh, to uh, political legitimacy because it's a historically constructed legitimacy because since its creation in 1946 it was uh, a political organization by de facto uh, it doesn't uh, compete in election they considered recently competing in election but they refused and, and I think it was a smart choice otherwise they couldn't intervene in this kind of situations exactly. and play the role of the neutral, neutral mediator uh, Utica usually is on the side uh, to show that both business people and workers work hand in hand but we know that UGTT is the most influential one uh, however, I think, the, do you have another question or do you want to? I have my, one more yeah. short question for you. Let me, and let me ask it. So, so um, in, um, in line with the, the topic of the panel today, um, what broader political trends are concerning you right now? Is it consensus politics versus majoritarian politics? Is there another, another issue that's concerning mm -hmm. you more? Uh, and just a quick answer so we can leave that. Yes. Yeah. So even though apparently here we see again the the role that consensus politics play with the intervention of UGT, <coughs> when we see the names and the individuals who are appointed or will be appointed in the government, I think there will be another problem of consensus within the, the government itself. The prime minister... Uh, he's coming from the business sector. Before being a minister of tourism, he worked for one of the big uh, 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 family-owned businesses in the country. He um, he's the one who signed the IMF agreement in 2013, very controversial agreement that is still going on until now. Um, we also have the f uh, prime, uh, the minister of finance, who is coming from a uh, well-known consulting firm in France, also from a business background. So both have more pro-business you know, liberal orientation. However, we find that the same government, uh, um, people who are, have more uh, uh, socialist uh, uh, orientations. Uh, the Minister of Commerce will go to Harak al Shab, uh, a, a Nasserist uh, uh, political party that give importance to the intervention of state in the economy, not as a regulator, but as an owner. And they ex previously expressed their opposition to the ALECA, Al Al the uh, deep and complete free trade agreement with the EU that is being currently negotiated. So you have Minister of Commerce who is pr uh, again, uh, against free trade with the EU, but at the same time, Prime Minister who is pro-EU. So in, when it comes to economic policies, and that's actually the most important uh, uh, 
topics of debate that we will see during the upcoming years, there is no consensus within the same government. And we will see tensions, we will see uh, ministers resisting to the prime minister, uh, we will see bureaucrats also supporting their own ministers against the prime minister. So uh, here the, the, the main problem that we'll face is not with the political consensus between political party, but the, uh, the, the lack of ideological consensus. Uh, historically, and uh, it was easy under the authoritarian regime of Ben Ali <coughs> to impose a consensus that is aligned with the Washington consensus. However, since 2011, uh, it became more difficult to preserve that economic consensus against, uh, in favor of uh, pro-market policies. And we see m the rise of more alternative forms, uh, alternative economic policies, and maybe I think that will be the most important debate during the upcoming years. Thank you for that deeply knowledgeable, well-informed introduction. Um, um, and I'm, I'm going to have to leave right at 4.30, but I would welcome you to stay on for an after discussion with uh, our experts here, who uh, well, I presume will be able to stay a little bit longer. Um, so next we have uh, my longtime friend, mentor, uh, 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 Daniel Bromberg. Um, he's Director of Democracy and Governance Studies at Georgetown University and a senior non-resident fellow at the project uh, on Middle East Democracy, POMED. Not POMEPS, but POMED. Get that. <laughs> uh, from 2008 through 2015, he also served as Special Advisor of the United States Institute of Peace. Uh, in addition his position, uh, to his position at Georgetown, he served as Visiting Professor of Kuwait Gulf Studies at Sciences Po in Paris and continues to serve as a faculty member for the St. Martin Georgetown University Program in Public Policy in Buenos Aires. Uh, uh, he, you get around. Yeah. Uh, his articles have appeared in leading print and online journals. And when the Arab Center stopped asking me to write on Tunisia, it's because they've got Daniel to start. I'm sorry, Anna. Because <laughs> so, okay, they have me write on other stuff. Good. So, um, so uh, 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 Daniel, uh, my uh, first question to you is, what's your argument in your new Journal of Democracy article about consensus politics yeah. and Tunisia's transitions? Yeah. Well, thanks very much for, uh, for having me here. And Bill, thanks for the introduction. Uh, first time we've seen the new digs. Yeah. It's very, very impressive. So um, uh, yes, what is my argument? Well, the argument is basically that consensus politics or a consensus-based system in which all the main parties are included is necessary when there isn't any consensus. That's the paradox of this system. In a society that is divided along social, ideological, political, geographical lines, and when those lines are reflected in a proportional system such as the one that exists in Tunisia, you have a very divided political field in which there isn't one party that necessarily is going to capture a majority. Moreover, because Tunisia in so many ways is a divided society, and it is true, and I completely agree, that the kind of modernist, Islamist kind of labels are very misleading, and it's much more complicated, there is a significant aspect of this sort of struggle over issues of identity. And when those issues are reflected in the, in, in the electoral map, it becomes even more difficult to have a majoritarian system because those who are outside of it fear exclusion. They, they fear that they'll be excluded, and of course, the fear is on all sides, and not the fears that the more secularly oriented parties, leftist parties. So rather than risk a majoritarian form of government that might lead to your political exclusion or, your, or, or losing your rights or having your rights diminished, um, you agree that everybody's going to be participate. It's a, you know, I call it in the paper a kind of ceasefire um, in which basically precisely because nobody trusts anybody, they're going to stay, they're going to you know, hold your enemies closer basically. And so there is the illusion of consensus uh, because none of the parties believe that they can risk walking away from it. <laughs> the, con the hell they know is better than the one they don't know. So why risk that? And of course, the good news in this sense, first of all, I think it's important to say this, and somebody, uh, my, myself, I spent years, I still work on Iran and I still work on Egypt. In other words, I, I've made my career working on authoritarianism is that this is real democratic politics. There's nothing unusual or unique, maybe Tunisia in the context of the Arab world, but Tunisia in the sense of representing a case of the problems and liabilities of consensus politics is very familiar. Um, but the other part of my argument is basically that to get the consensus, the political pact, the agreement, to get everybody together, you have to make certain kinds of concessions 
that have a long-term impact on the transition. Because basically what you agree to do is to disagree. And therefore, the consensus-based system that is reflected in the Constitution itself, in the Constitution itself, in the wording of the Constitution, uh, is a, was an agreement to disagree and to postpone conflicts down the road. Um, and so whether we're talking about the absence of a Supreme Court or what to do with the security apparatus and chiefly what to do about the economic situation, all of those things are postponed um, because nobody wants to make a move. So it's a, it, it's, a, it's a recipe for what I call in the paper frantic immobilism. <laughs> and um, and um, that's what we've seen. And, it's, and, and the paper talks about this, and I must say that, I, that I'm not the sole author. Mariam Ben Salam, a, a colleague of mine who teaches in Tunis, is the co-author. Um, uh, we use different cases uh, of transitional justice, of the debate over the inheritance law, and we start with the economic realm to illustrate the cost, the, the many costs to a system in which basically you agree to, um, to, uh, to not resolve these issues, and over time, the costs mount on every level, security apparatus, economics, justice, uh, that's, that's, that's what you face. Um, and there's no obvious uh, alternative because it's a very pluralistic society. <laughs> and the system reflects that. But the problem with the system that reflects it, it can institutionalize those different and, and so this is where Tunisia uh, comes to now. And after all the elections, and the, would be the ninth prime minister, I think, of the government, um, we've come up with a, a, a scenario that looks very similar to what we've already seen. And that's, you know, somewhat disconcerting, but I'll end, I'll end here and simply say that, as I say, as we say in the paper, while this is not the best outcome you want, it's better than the alternative. Uh, you have to figure this out. But I don't see any, uh, you know, we call this paper the, 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 the troubled path to a second transition. By second transition, we mean moving beyond the consensus and dealing with the issues that were postponed and moving towards a majoritarian system. It's really hard to imagine how Tunisia is going to do that. Because as soon as you try to do it, the stakes are immediately magnified. Uh, and so as, as troubling as the path to a second transition is, um, given the costs uh, and given the, 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 the potential for more dissension, it's probably going to be the kind of status quo, or the norm uh, for Tunisia for, for quite a while. And thank you for pointing out the point about Tunisian pluralism, because it's a small country of only over 11 million people. And a lot of analysts and a lot of Tunisians will constantly tell you about how homogeneous uh, uh, Tunisia is. And, 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 and that there's something essential <laughs> about Tunisian culture that it allows oh, to do X, no. Y, and Z, like Musri's book, which, oh. And the, pl the pluralism of Tunisia is, is amazing. The diversity of yeah. what Tunisia is about. Is, is really important. I do want to add one point, and that is the much vaunted um, uh, National Dialogue, which merited the, yeah. the award, the, the Nobel. The th interesting thing about that, it was led by a, a number of organizations, principally Uge de Tete, whose only common concern was stopping the Nacht. Yeah. <laughs> and the intervention of Uge de Tete and the, and, 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 its, and the quartet allowed for the re-entrance of the Ancien Regime actors into the political arena big time. Mm. Um, and, and their goal was to limit the power of an acta by, by creating a possibility because the, the, the constituent assembly was, was stalemate. So from that, from 2014 on, we get this system born uh, of a essential and deep mistrust of the other guys. And that is something to, to keep in mind. So um, my second in short introductory question, which I hope you'll get a short answer so we can move down, uh, down one the row, uh, will be, um, uh, if I oversimplify your approach in your article and oversimplify your approach in your article, and uh, you can agree or disagree with this, but I think one of the differences is that Sharon focuses more on what's wrong with consensus, and I think you focus more on what's different about Tunisia and, and identi identity politics in Tunisia. And I wonder um, if that's really what's special about Tunisia's problems in getting to a, 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 a second transition and getting this to work, that there are things that are different about Tunisia in terms of a pacted transition Great and question. its identitary question, Great question. you know, uh, uh, that, that, are, that, that make it a different case. Two things. Yeah. First of all, Eugène Dete is unique. Yeah. 
uh, th th there's nothing like it <laughs> in the region. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it's, it's a kind of mishmash of nationalism, Tunisian, I mean, just, yeah. and, and so, and, and it's, it's not one thing. And it's, it's not one thing. And it's, and, and, it's and, in there. and they play the game of being very politically influential by not being a political party. <laughs> it's the perfect strategy. It's, so that's, you know, brilliant. And that let them, so now they're doing like national dialogue number two. I mean, there's a kind of aspect of that. Um, but they have deep interests. And during the creation of the National Dialogue, they threatened to bring their people on the street. If, uh, as, as the leader of the USDA told me at the time, it was Plan B. <laughs> so, uh, and then, of course, I think that, you know, uh, having been to Tunisia now 10 times and spent quite a bit of time and taught there, I think that sort of identity issues are real. Yeah. Uh, they're not contrived. I, I mean, everything's socially constructed, so what's new? But, but, but they're real and they're deep and they tend to magnify the perception of losing, the cost, because it's not just about economics. It's about sort of what, what kind of, what's your definition of identity, where you stand, and what, what language do you speak, and, where, and that just adds to sort of the difficulty of, 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 of imagining that you could possibly lose an election or be outside of the system because, the, and of course, and that deeply fears exclusion and for good reason. But their rivals also have the same fears. And I think that's something that really is an important aspect. To you. Thank you, Daniel. See how great this panel is? All right, so uh, uh, next we've got Sharon Gruel, um, who's an assistant professor of government at the College of William and Mary and a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution. He received a PhD in politics from Princeton University in 2018. His research examines democratization, security studies, and political Islam in the Arab world, especially Egypt, Tunisia, and Algeria. Uh, Sharon's work has been published or is forthcoming in the American Political Science Review, American Journal of Political Science, International Studies Quarterly, the Journal of Conflict Resolution, and more. Uh, he's also written for Foreign Policy, Brookings, and Carnegie, among others. And is really one of our core North Africa guys in, 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 in Washington, D.C. right now. We just don't like when you go down to Virginia and you don't come back for long. <laughs> yeah, we need you up here more often. Um, so my first question to you is... Uh, What's your central argument, and do you feel it's pretty much the same argument that Daniel's making, or there's important differences to Daniel's argument? Mm -hmm. So I was glad to hear uh, about Daniel's paper, forthcoming yeah. paper, and that, for the most part, is consistent with the argument that Shadi and I make in this recent Brookings paper. Uh, the basic argument... Which is called? The Dark Side of Consensus. And as you can tell from the title... Yeah. Uh, as you can tell from the title, our main point is that while consensus politics in Tunisia has been important, has been useful, especially in the early years of the transition for keeping the transition on track. Uh, there have been some dark sides to extending that consensus uh, now for eight, nine years. Uh, and in particular, we focus on the decision in 2015 to form the national unity government between Nidatunis and Anahda. Uh, essentially, we're saying that prior to that, from 2011 to 2014, consensus was important. You need to have consensus over the constitution, over the rules of the game, what political scientists refer to as the rules of the game, the rules that are governing the new democracy. Uh, but once those rules are set, uh, political scientists at least believe that democracies, uh, that the transition to democracy should be over, and then uh, the democracy should function as a normal democracy, which is that political parties represent distinct constituencies, uh, and they compete for votes on distinct platforms. Uh, and what we argue is that the decision in 2015 to form this grand national unity government uh, meant instead that the transition to democracy would be continuing, uh, that you wouldn't see that differentiation of political parties into representing different camps, uh, but instead they would be governing uh, uh, even longer uh, by consensus. And so we argue that while that was important in some regards and, and beneficial in some regards, it also had some dark sides uh, that hadn't been emphasized enough. Uh, among them that, that Daniel also mentioned uh, was that they abandoned security sector reform, that they abandoned transitional justice, uh, that they could not actually find consensus on the constitutional court or on uh, many of the economic reforms. Uh, but beyond that, there were also some dark sides in terms of having all of the parties, almost 80% of the parliament together in the government. What it meant is that you ne never developed a strong opposition uh, who would be able to actually uh, block 
uh, certain uh, uh, policies from passing. And so the effect of that is both institutionally, you don't see a strong government and opposition parties, uh, but also it led to disillusionment with the whole process, where Tunisians uh, who did not want some of these policies passed, such as the reconciliation law in 2017, did not have opposition channels to express that opposition and to get uh, policies actually blocked. And so the effect uh, has been some of these dark sides uh, along with this national unity government. Uh, but the other contribution uh, of the paper, which is very relevant for understanding what's happening today in Tunisia, is to understand the motivations for why the parties in 2015 wanted a national unity government, because many of those motivations are present today uh, as, as once again, uh, the parties are trying to form a government. Uh, and so there are some incentives that all parties share for wanting a national unity government, right? They don't, uh, it's a way to avoid blame when uh, policies fail. Uh, it's difficult to tell which policy, which party is responsible for that, for that failure. Uh, but there are also some uh, incentives that particular parties have in national unity or in consensus government. And where I would disagree, I think, with Daniel uh, is that there are some parties who want consensus more than others. And in particular in Tunisia, it is a NAFTA that is uh, especially uh, pushing uh, of consensus. We don't actually unity. disagree on that at all. <laughs> no, no, honestly, I mean, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. uh, and good, with good reason. And, and the reason. Uh, so find another disagreement. <laughs> Better find another one. That one, so, bing. So what Daniel was saying was that all the parties fear exclusion uh, if they are not involved in the international unity government. But I think that that fear is especially palpable for Anatha. Because for Anatha, what uh, their concern is, is that if you have a majoritarian government where uh, the government, for instance, uh, is led by uh, parties affiliated with the old regime, whereas the opposition is more pro-revolution, or the converse, uh, where the government is led by pro-revolution parties like the Troika and the opposition uh, is led by rem remnants of the old regime, that those situations uh, will bring back the polarization that Tunisia faced in 2012-2013. It will uh, lead once again uh, mm. to the potential collapse of the transition, that it will uh, lead to so much polarization uh, that democracy as a whole uh, may collapse. But what's in particular uh, Anatha's incentive is that what they fear uh, is that they will be repressed, even dissolved as a party, if those, if that level of polarization returns. Uh, there are still cases in the, in the court system in Tunisia uh, accusing Anatha of having a secret apparatus that was responsible for assassinations in, in 2013 is, is the charge uh, in, in those court cases, uh, or that they had facilitated the flow of foreign fighters uh, to ISIS. Uh, and so on those basis, uh, Anatha could be dissolved. And so the fear that Anatha has is that if we go back to a Troika-style government where uh, essentially what the current prime minister designate was proposing, Elias Fakhfak, was proposing essentially a pro-revolution government, uh, whereas the uh, anti-revolution parties would be in the opposition. What are not the fears is that if you have that polarization once again, uh, that those court cases may pass and Anatha may be uh, may be dissolved, that that uh, polarization is too much to handle at the moment. Uh, and so that, I think, is what is unique about Anatha and why they are pushing more so than any other party uh, for national unity. Um, your article and your article uh, brilliantly explain uh, aspects of why Nehda did what it did. Um, show how democracy is on shaky ground in Tunisia, but not so shaky that we're imagining other more likely uh, outcomes. And it explains, I think, really well why the, there's been very little economic reform, uh, the, you know, effective economic reform, and also uh, the constitutional court impasse. Where I'm not sure I agree uh, in that there's a possibility you may have over-argued what's wrong with consensus is on security sector reform and transitional justice, where the pushback from the security sector and the police unions in particular probably would have happened even without a consensus government. And the um, uh, transitional justice issues um, have 
a lot of systemic and post-revolutionary aspects that I also don't think have as much to do with consensus uh, as, as, as you may have said. So I was wondering if you could address that um, sense that it's, it's possible that you may have just a little bit over-argued what consensus blocks and that Tunisia would have had problems anyway, even if they chose majoritarian approaches. Mm -hmm. Certainly there was pushback from the security sector uh, under the Troika, right? When the initial window of opportunity was there for security sector reform, already there was pushback from the security sector, uh, and that's where you saw the proliferation of police unions to try to defend uh, the security sector against these yeah. uh, uh, reforms for, for change. Uh, and yes, uh, so under the national unity government in 2015, uh, that just, was taken off the table entirely. Uh, and so had instead uh, uh, there been a push for a security sector reform uh, in 2015, uh, which is, uh, would have been unlikely since Anatha and the pro-revolution parties would have gone to the opposition in this counterfactual, uh, I, I don't think you would have seen any uh, security sector reform either or, either. or yeah. any pushback. Yeah. Uh, but what it would have done is to keep that issue afloat uh, with Anatha in the opposition championing the need for security sector reform and for continued transitional justice, uh, and therefore allow that opportunity, window of opportunity to reemerge uh, in the next elections to therefore uh, tackle those issues. I think you will give him the PhD, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I would, you know. So um, next we're going to turn to Sabina, but before I do that, I'm going to do our like obligatory Sabina. shout out for American Tunisian Association. Uh, we're both serving board members. I'm President Emeritus. She's the new secretary uh, taking over for Gordon Brown, who did that job for how long? 20 years? Yeah, <laughs> a long time. And we really miss him uh, as he transitioned out of the role. Uh, but uh, American Tunisian Association does three events a year, has some social events, has a growing <coughs> web and Facebook presence. Uh, where we post a lot of news articles along with POMED and, and others on what's going on uh, in Tunisia. And we would love to have you join join us uh, and we can give you information uh, after this meeting or via email or any other way through our website on how to join. I don't know if Sabina wants to add anything to that, but I'm going to introduce her first. Sabina Henneberg is a visiting <laughs> scholar at Jordan, Johns Hopkins Uni uh, University School of Advanced International Studies, SICE, and author of Managing Transition, the first post-uprising phase in Tunisia and Libya. She currently works as a senior content analyst at Hanover Research, where she focuses on higher education research. Previously, she was a postdoctoral fellow in the Africa Studies Program at Johns Hopkins University School for Advanced International Studies and taught as an adjunct faculty member in the School of International uh, Service at American mm -hmm. University, where I teach now. As she also serves as a Tunisia country specialist for Amnesty International. And my question for you is, having read drafts or final versions of the two articles, um, what are your initial uh, uh, insights or reactions to this discussion and what you read in the articles? Yeah, thanks. And thanks for coming and for including me on this panel. Um, I'm really glad to have the chance to reflect on Tunisia's current situation and on these really important papers. Um, I thought I would sort of react by offering a couple thoughts and questions on some of the possible origins of this current situation um, and possible lessons from Tunisia's recent political history. Uh, first thought slash question I had was about the brief period before any elections took place, but after Ben Ali had fled. Um, so February to, to November October, of 2011. Yeah, 2011. Um, my understanding of that period is that there were representatives of different political parties and other organizations um, also operating on the principle of consensus, um, but unlike their successor governments, were actually able to reach mutually acceptable decisions. So just a first point of reflection is sort of what changed exactly when and why. Um, in Tunisia's transition. Mm -hmm. uh, because then, as we know, one of the very important decisions that was made during that period was the electoral system, the temporary electoral system that permitted the election of the Troika government. Um, and that was also the time of the first cross-ideological cross, cross coalition. 
Uh, and as we know, the, the period when polarization really spiked. And so I just thought it might be helpful to reflect on the relationship between that um, government or that cross ideological coalition and the rising polarization of that period. Um, as I understand it, some of the Anahta absorbed a lot of the criticism for what was going wrong at that time, um, partly because of its inexperience, um, uh, also just the context of the time was uh, there was rising insecurity and growing opposition to the Islamist government in Egypt. Um, I understand that it was also, there was also an argument for forming a broader um, consensus or coalition at the time because it was not a typical parliament um, but a constitution writing assembly where that needed to be as inclusive as possible in order to write a, su a successful constitution. Um, and then as we've already discussed a little, the sort of peak of that polarization was overcome yeah. with the um, quartet. Yeah, the facilitation yeah. of the quartet and the national dialogue. Um, and so I just wonder what other lessons we can draw from these um, maybe sort of isolated moments where Tunisians are able to scramble out of a crisis. The municipal elections of 2017 is another. Um, I don't know, but I thought those those might be moments also worth dwelling on a little more, although we've already talked about the national dialogue some. Um, and then the last sort of more general question I wanted to pose to these authors and these panelists, um, which I'm sure you've thought about, I thought it might be helpful for the discussion now, <coughs> is um, just what would Alfred Stepan say, or anyone who has argued that Tunisia is different than other countries because it has a history of groups of different sort of ideological persuasions learning to tolerate each other. Um, and yet right now we see this complete lack of trust. So what, how would he explain that? Uh, brilliant points. And before I turn to the panelists, I'm going to ask you one other question. But also to your list, I would add uh, uh, late 13, 14. Once again, the polarization was overcome the consensus <clears throat> government, the constitution, I mean, the, there was that moment as right. well, and others I can think of. Mm -hmm. uh, we often focus on the polarization and consensus as the negative alternative to it, but there were these seminal moments where mm -hmm. Tunisia overcame some of the things we're talking about. Uh, um, my, so my, my other question to you is, um, if you haven't already answered this, what does your own research on Tunisia lend to this analysis here. So what were your conclusions in your uh, PhD relevant to this uh, uh, this discussion, if you haven't already uh, uh, fully outlined that? Um, so my research focused on that first phase, that very short phase from January 14th to October 23rd in 2011. Um, I think a lot of the people I've spoken with just say that was a very unique phase. Um, uh, the mentality that I would say described it that went away then is just that there was an attitude of prioritizing Tunisia's transition and what's good for Tunisia over individual political interests. Yeah. Um, so in some ways, as Daniel Brumberg has said, this is now democratic politics, yeah. and that was very unique. Um, but yeah, it's really important, I think, now that we're, we're asking ourselves what can we do to get that back or somehow get this mutual trust back. So. Yeah, that's the only other thing I've been thinking about is, is there a way to, are there either activities or another actor, not the <clears throat> UCTT, but um, someone who can really play a unifying role, uh, who's not from politics, of course, and not a, a new populist politician, um, or other things that can help remind Tunisians of their shared identity and their shared goals, and whether those something like that could help facilitate right now. Mohamed Dia, so would you like to, to a, disagree. <laughs> a, ans answer any of the things raised on the panel before we turn to the audience? Yes. Or B, and or B, answer the Al Stepan question, which I'll also pose to you. Yeah. Maybe. And or and or C. Um, Don't put a D in there. Yeah. Though, um, I, as in in one of the write ups on what we're talking about today, I, I posed, I posited, um, uh, 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 consensus politics. 
majoritarian politics and anti-politics, mm -hmm. sort of casting mm -hmm. populism mm -hmm. as anti-politics. Uh, I don't know if you have a thought on that uh, yeah. frame as well. So I have to choose one of them? And or. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I'll start with, uh, I don't I think it's the, the A one. Yeah. Uh, so uh, regarding uh, Saran's paper, uh, there are two points that I think uh, I would like to make. One is regarding uh, another behavior during the current negotiation. So if another is in favor of consensus politics because they are afraid for, of their own survival, they want to be in the government, why in this context are they uh, advocating for Qalbtunis joining the government and not only themselves? Second thing regarding the security... Which got the second most votes. Yes, in the and also it's problematic political party. Second thing also regarding the security sector reform. Um, uh, during the current negotiations, Tayyar uh, Democrati, the uh, Democratic Current, wanted to suggest some reforms, taking out the judiciary police and putting it under the uh, the Ministry of uh, Justice, which is, I think, an interesting approach. Uh, the argument was that the police, so Nahda was uh, didn't like it, and Jomli didn't oppose it, claiming that it was the police union. I don't think it's the police union. Police union usually. One, they publish statements when they disagree with with things. They are public; they don't have problem with publicity. Second thing, the police unions today are way weaker than they were a while ago because of basic um, collective action problems. So uh, the other point is regarding the uh, lack of consensus and the inability to pass economic reforms. So if we count the number of very important reform that were passed since uh, the government of Troika, the list would be quite long. Usually we have the perception that reforms were not done because you, IMF always asks for more. Uh, however, the Code of Investment was passed, the Startup Act was passed, the recent law on encouragement of investment was passed, the, the uh, financial reforms a lot, some of them went through laws like the independence of the central bank, uh, and other reforms that were less, that went through um, other mechanisms than, than laws of the parliament were passed. Uh, a significant number of pro-market uh, reforms <coughs> were passed since 2011. So, and that's something that I don't see in, in the part on, of your report on... on, uh, on uh, so, how, how would you see things evolving in the future when we have people who disagree on economic policy with the same program. Don't you think that the reason why we're seeing a decrease of the adoption of economic laws since 2016 is because of the, of the failure of the e earlier reform to fix the problem and the rise of most, more contestatory voices that are in favor of, of more involvement of the state and less pro-market uh, uh, policies? Um, what was it, the C point? C was uh, <laughs> that frame of majoritarian versus uh, consensus versus anti-politics mm -hmm. and whether you had any thoughts on yes, that. Yes, there is another yeah. I would, uh, 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 fourth one which would be more revolutionary approach, yeah. which is uh, not caring about the old regime and trying to push yeah. for uh, more uh, radical. Uh, 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 so, for example, regarding when it comes to confiscation of the assets of uh, the family of the president, this was not based on debate. Uh, it was more in the context of revolution. There were other reforms that were suggested also in the same way. They were revolutionary. The, code, exactly. Yeah. Same thing regarding the security sector. Should we engage in a discussion with other people or should we exploit that frame? And to go back to your point regarding 2011, there was an expression that was used in 2011, uh, um, the revolutionary legitimacy an expression that was used in 2011 when there was no constitution, there was no uh, electoral legitimacy, the legitimacy was the, the revolutionary itself. legitimacy. Yeah, yeah. So, that. which is, I think, a frame that is usually forgotten because, uh, I mean, there is some problems coming from academia and transitology and that, that has its own uh, problems. And But the, the discourse on revolution is, I think, a discourse that we shouldn't uh, neglect. Um, uh, the idea of anti-politics and the death of politics, I, I, I don't think uh, we are in this, in this situation right now. Even the, uh, some people said, like, 
throwing a uh, 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 Kaisa Said in the uh, populist the huge box where we put everyone else. I think it's more coming from more maybe intellectual laziness to instead of understanding his he is hmm? yeah. what he exactly is exactly. Yeah. So I, he's very his project is very political. I don't think uh, he has right now uh, uh, enough support among the rest of the political elite to pass it. But in order just to pass the one, you need pol you need politics. Even his project is the idea of uh, further decentralization and kind of bottom up construction of the national institution doesn't kill politics. It it actually needs more uh, uh, political engagement at the very local level. So that's so, uh, answering before to we let Sharon answer your. Uh, con contestatory remark. Um, uh, I'm going to turn to Daniel Very quick, and, and let him really pick fast. whatever he wants to say. First of all, the th th this yeah. paper, you know, was 9,000 words in the beginning, uh, and then got cut and cut because the journal wanted 6,500 words. So the yeah. section on, on that crucial period you were talking about isn't there. I do think it's a crucial because, and it came, you know, it, it unfolded at, at the same time that what was going on in Egypt. And that was very important because there was this fear in that hot summer of 2013 that somehow these things would be replicated. And the other thing I forgot to mention, of course, is that Tunisia doesn't have a militarized, a politicized military. Yeah. So the actors don't have an opportunity to solve their collective action problems by running to the military, having them, you know, champion. So that's a good thing. You, Tunisians fight or they talk or whatever, but they, there isn't an obvious simple solution, or it's not simple, but that a la Egypt. Um, and I think that's a... You know, that to me is much more important than Al Stepan's view of, yeah. of, you know, which I think has aspects of essentializing what Tunisian yeah. sort of society is about. And, and finally, I, I would, you know, just mention two things. First of all, what we, we mark these periods where we think we have a consensus, but it, it's precisely those periods where there's an agreement to manage consensus. It's not consensus. It's a toleration of, di of it's an agreement to, dis to, 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 not, to not agree. Yeah. That's not consensus. Yeah. <laughs> that's 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 the that's the that's that right, force the problem. Right. Force it's yeah. you know it's a marriage of convenience, um, and and then the other point is to get back to a point that was really important is that you know Renouchi you know his fear of exclusion his worry about these things led him to accept all kinds of legislation that you would otherwise think that a Nazi would never, and not to mess with the security and, and accept all kinds of things because. He didn't want to rock the like, boat. Like the economic reconciliation Yes, he didn't law, want to rock the boat. Which let a lot of people off without being put on trial. And I yeah. talked at length about this, but I had to extract it from my paper. And so he ended up, and that, and, and the, other, the other cost of those kinds of compromises is it really erodes the legitimacy of party leaders. In both Nidat Tunis and in Nakhda, there are important factions which felt, you know, you are making too many concessions. You are going too far. You, and, you know, Renouchi was seen by many actors as just basically what, what's left of an Islamist party here. So when you have a consensus-based system, by definition, it erodes the kind of building of, uh, of, um, of, of unity and, uh, and coherence in political parties. It's a high cost to the, the system. So we don't have too much more time We're, before we go to questions, but I, I know you might want to address what Mohamed Dia said and then any other brief uh, comment you want to make. Sure. So let me just make two quick points because I do want to open it up for questions. Uh, so the first about why does Anatha in today's crisis want Kaldunis in the government as well? Uh, I think what their fear is is that the proposal uh, that uh, Elias Fakhfakh had proposed would have been a recreation of the Troika government. Uh, in many ways, in fact, Fakhfakh himself uh, had been a member of Atakatul. Uh, Tayar today, the democratic current, is essentially CPR of before, uh, with Anatta involved as well. It would have been, in some ways, the Troika 2.0 uh, versus an opposition that had been Nidatunas and is now the remnants of Nidatunas, Kalb Tunis, uh, as well as PDL, uh, the, the Free Distorian Party of Abir Musi. And so, which was the name of the party he forgot. Yes. <laughs> the Free Distorian <laughs> Party of Abir Musi, which I forgot too right after he forgot it. So. And, so, yes. and so without Kalb Tunis, it would have been a, in many ways a Troika 2.0, where you have the pro-revolution parties on one side and the anti-revolution parties on the other, which would lead to the polarization that Anatha would fear, a recreation of 2012-2013. Uh, and the second point, uh, which ties uh, very much into this, is to emphasize one thing that Daniel had, had mentioned in his first, uh, as well as second intervention, which is that what the national unity government did in 2015 
uh, is agree to disagree, was to postpone those divisive issues about uh, revolutionary issues like transitional justice or so, uh, security sector reform, was to postpone issues of uh, legitimate differences on secular versus uh, Islamism in terms of, uh, uh, terms, of, in terms of government. And so those issues were swept under the rug as opposed to being resolved, which has had the effect of those cleavages remaining mm -hmm. and re-emerging mm -hmm. in 2019. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas we had all hoped that the 2019 elections would have been about economic issues, that the parties would have taken stances uh, in terms of some of the austerity reforms, pro and against, uh, or in terms of advocating new economic policies, we didn't see that in these past elections. Instead, uh, what you saw again were the same debates uh, about pro-revolution, anti-revolution, secular versus Islamist. I actually did one uh, survey in September of 2019, right before the elections, uh, a nationally representative face-to-face uh, -face survey with one-to-one -one for research and polling. And I asked uh, Tunisians, can you place the different presidential candidates uh, on these different scales? In terms of economic left-right dimension, uh, all of the candidates were the same. It was only on issues of secular Islamists, could, could people differentiate the, the politicians? Uh, and on issues of pro-revolution or anti-revolution, could they differentiate the candidates? Yeah. So economic issues, which we had hoped would become uh, the main issue for the 2019 elections, did not. I think precisely because of the national unity government uh, postponing rather than resolving those ideological issues. Or because all Tunisians are free market socialists, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, as we've heard Very times. Times. So, yeah. um, so um, I don't know which comments you may want to make a further comment on, but I had a question in my mind based on what you said too, which you may want to factor into your remarks, which is one of the things that was different in 2011 to 2013, where we went from high consensus to low, 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 low consensus that almost upset the whole apple cart, was the disappearance of women's groups from the scene after 2011 because they were too close to the Ben Ali regime, what we sometimes refer to in academia as regime feminism. And it was in part the reconstitution of the women's movements in 12 and 13, which then caused the crisis of 13, which then led to the Nobel Prize. Um, but So I wondered if you had any thoughts on that, sort of the, the disappearance of the women's groups and then the reemergence of the women's groups, which also is in Abir Musa's party as well, like that that feminist critique of the Islamists. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that aspect of it or any of the other things you heard. OK, thanks. Uh, I actually had really hoped to take this opportunity to pose a question. Oh, please. Sort of the yeah, first yeah, yeah, question yeah. to the panelists yeah. it wasn't about um, the role of women's movements now, yeah. but I would love to hear whatever else um, those who really have their pulse on the current situation yeah. have to say about that. I, I thought I had the understanding that um, within um, women's movements, there's still an old regime versus, yeah. um, I guess, the identity split too. So it's not just one type of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the other thought I had was about one particular issue that uh, we've touched on a little bit. Maybe it's no different than the others, but I wondered if you guys thought that right now there's an opportunity for security sector reform, or maybe it's even beginning given that um, I guess Tunisia made it through 2019 without any big high-profile incidents. Yeah. Um, I guess the, the police unions have receded a little bit, and then with fewer old regime people in decision-making roles right now. Does anyone want to deal with the security sector reform before we open it up? I can go. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I think you, you're right. I think there is there is an opportunity right now to. Uh, to pass some reforms and, and the Tayar, it seems that Tayar have been thinking about this and the idea of taking uh, part of the Ministry of Interior and putting it in the judiciary is, I think, only one part of a, of a broader uh, conceptualization of the way the security sector reform should. However, I think that the main problem of the whole debate on, so, on, uh, so, on uh, security sector reform is its monopolization by international actors. Uh, the way Tunisian, we don't have, for example, any Tunisian NGO working on security sector reform. Mm -hmm. There have been one once a while ago, and it, it was dissolved and disappeared, and its founder moved to business. Um, uh, and more than that, like myself, when I try to have discussion with people who are working for international organization to myself as a Tunisian understand what's going on, it's really difficult to get the information to see 
uh, why the resistance uh, is, is, is organizing and how. And so, so there is a problem of visibility and inclusion and not only inclusion, but I think if a security sector reform uh, uh, will succeed, it needs to be done by Tunisians, uh, not only monopolized by um, organization. I guess we all know the organization involved. Um, the mechanism that was created in G8, even uh, G8 plus, uh, there is a rotation who's heading it, was also re even emphasized more this kind of appropriation by of the security reform by uh, the providers of uh, uh, assistance, whatever in terms of weapons or equipment or, or technical expertise. So I think it's time right now to uh think about this seriously and even within the the community of those who work on technical assistance there is a recognition that the reform the, the attempts of reform didn't work that there is a resistance within not only the police people who want to to again but even among bureaucrats which is pretty common across the whole all the ministries mm -hmm. so uh i i think there is a necessity here to try to think of different approaches of uh, passing these reforms. And that relates directly to transitional justice and the reconciliation that still hasn't happened. After all, those tens of thousands of Tunisians suffered various things over the pre-revolutionary years that still haven't been addressed. Let's open it up for three questions. Uh, Marina, would you like to take the first one? You don't have to identify yourself, but try to keep it short and as a question. Yeah, Marina. Yeah, I feel I don't quite I don't see clearly this the, uh, distinction between consensus politics and majoritarian politics. Yes, I know what the words mean, yeah. but I don't think the possibility of majoritarian politics ever existed in Tunisia. <laughs> in other words, there was no majority, to, uh, no majoritarian government that could be formed after the elections. Ah. They slipped into consensus politics but because there were no alternatives, essentially. And it was the same with, uh, you know, with the intervention of the quartet earlier. The quartet, in the end, played the role it did and forced uh, this uh, government of national reconciliation because the Troika was going strictly nowhere. So is that distinction really very help helpful? Wow, what a question. Um, uh, right here. Yes, right here. Hi. Um, I wanted first to flex my Tunisia muscle by reminding everyone of uh, my esteemed countryman, Mohammed Al-Hashmi Al-Hamdi Al-Harid al that was like the second Islamist force in the country at the elections of 2011 that Nada voluntarily decided to disregard and Muhammad actually... Mohammed Al-Hashmi Hamdi. Yes. Okay. Yes, and actually give their, you know, uh, join forces with the Takatol that was in fourth spot, uh, fourth place, not even second. Um, this is something that I, I, I guess I agree with you, Professor, that it, it's actually a marriage of convenience. There was no consensus um, in so many uh, aspects of the, uh, the process. Um, but I, I'm going to hijack the conversation here towards uh, transitional justice. How successful was the process, with all things considered, that Tunisia has um, chose this path, disregarding the uh, wounds of the past, as we say? Thank you. Uh, and one from here, sir. Yes. Uh, I wonder why none of the distinguished speakers. Yeah, I wonder why none of the dis distinguished speakers uttered a single word about the media in Tunisia. I think the media in Tunisia has never been so free. And most Tunisian human rights groups are currently deeply concerned about the future of the media when you have a parliament where most of its members never had a reputation for caring about freedom of expression or the, uh, or the freedom of the press. In addition, I just would like to remind that uh, the Nabil Karwi and Rash al Ghanoushi has been since 2011 one of the fiercest uh, opponents to genuine media reform. And if Anahda and 
قلب تونس did well it's because their respective outlets Nesma TV for قلب تونس and the Zetuna TV are uh, broadcasting illegally and both parties in parliament now are just are paving the way for passing a new broadcasting law that would provide Tunisia with a toothless regulator, just less independent than the current one known as the Haika. Thank you. I'm going to let Daniel go first okay. and make sure you answer Marina's right. question first. It's a very good question because my paper said there isn't. I mean, this is what we have. This is the norm. This is going to be, you know, this is Tunisia. And it's because it's a, it's, a, it's a very pluralistic, divided society, it's going to be reflected in the electoral system. And, and, and we, you know, this is the aspiration to move towards a more egalitarian government is, is nice, but it's, it's, not, it's not going to happen. This is, we're going to have to manage the crises that result from and the challenges that result from the, doing it this way. And there's nothing unusual about this. I mean, we look at the United States right now. So I think that's very important. I mean, to, I said at the end of the paper, you know, the alternative is worse. So this is what you have. You have to learn to manage it. And it's very impressive having just worked on Egypt and other places where there's no recognition of a democratic way of managing differences to have this in Tunisia. It's a great step forward. But having said that, it comes with, and the reason why I, I contrast this with the alternative is it comes with very significant costs. Because to maintain the consensus, you have to not only make concessions, but you can make concessions that might lead to backsliding. And that's the problem. And there's a point, there is a point at which if you don't get some sort of momentum going, or we used to call democratic consolidation in the good old days, um, you can you can you can get uh, the uh, you can get two things. First of all, backsliding, whatever you wish to call it, uh, all kinds of laws that are tolerated uh, because uh, you don't want to break the consensus. And second of all, this you know this you don't build the kind of trust you need for a deeper kind of democracy. And maybe that's, you know, living in the country that we live in now, maybe well, here we are. So, you know, what's so unusual about that? Or look at other places, other countries, but you don't get it. So, but yes, absolutely. This is, uh, this is, this is how, this is how the Tunisian system works. And I don't think that raising the threshold from the zero point to the 5% mm -hmm. would help. It could further polarize the, the whole political arena. So it's not obvious that there's a political engineering solution. That, Well, confrontation avoidance is the name of the game. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to return to regular order, but thank you for that. Um, uh, I'd like to turn to you for the media question and anything else that we've yes. been hanging. Uh, yeah, uh, just before the media question yeah. for Eamon, just one one sentence. I think transition to justice in itself as a concept is overrated. So this is we the second question. expect that much. Yes, yeah. to go back to the media one. Yeah. Uh, yes, and I would add more to Nahda and, uh, and Qalb Tunis, who, uh, who benefited from, uh, from uh, Nisma and uh, Zaytuna, can also add Al uh, Hiwar al Tunsi and, and uh, Al Tesa working together in favor of uh, Yusuf al Shahid uh, against. Uh, uh, Nabil Al Qarwi. There was uh, there was some tensions during the the campaign, and they were fined several times by by Haika. But Haika has a problem of enforcement of a decision in, in uh, Nisma so and media outlets and the election authority. That he was yes. Yeah. Um, so what's interesting here is that usually there is a narrative uh, that goes back, I think, to the democratization experiences of the of the post Soviet uh, uh, countries, where a free media means necessarily a privately owned one. However, in this, in the, in the, in the current context, what we're seeing is those who are supporting somehow political parties without being uh, neutral or or um, media that are being manipulated, let's say, by political parties, are the ones who are privately owned. When we compare their their um, the quality or the prefer, professional the, the 
the quality of the the content that they're produ presenting to the uh, either state-owned ones, some of them, or those that were confiscated but don't really have a real owner, like for example, mentioned uh, Shams FM or or others who have relatively good quality, I think we should think of the way the media sphere is constructed in Tunisia. Should we keep relying on uh, on the media owned by uh, politically connected uh, individuals, or should we focus more on the development of a public sector? Like for, for France has a, an interesting experience, the UK as well. There are several democracies that uh, that succeeded in developing uh, uh, public uh, media. So, um, what, but when it comes to the to the parliament, I think that saying that the majority of members of the parliament are against freedom of press or something like that. No, I said never earned the reputation for defending. Yes, it's not. Maybe it's not their priorities, but I wouldn't say that. Um, that they are against freedom of press. The, an important number of them benefited from it and fought for it uh, during the Ben Ali period. Uh, later on, some of them switched sides and, and felt more comfortable in controlling media because it served their political agenda, yes. But I wouldn't say that the problem is with the, with the parliament as a whole. There is a critical number of parliamentarians, yes, who are not really supportive. I, I wouldn't disagree with you. Um, but I, I don't see how it, it influences uh, consensus politics. This is something I guess that we should think more about it. Would either of you like to address Ayman's question? Um, yes? <laughs> I, I had a brief thought, which is, yeah, just that it's a great question. I think about transitional justice just in the same way as what I was mentioning before, something that started out with a genuine commitment and sort of deep dissolved into a political issue. And I thought that was too bad, but um, I don't know what everyone else Other says. thoughts on Amy's question? No, no I yeah. completely agree. Um, so another round of questions in the back. Dario. Thank you. Um, I have like a scenario that I want to propose to Mohammedia and I want him to like uh, address it. Um, and it will touch upon like a few of the of the themes that uh, we discussed today. Uh, so um, I disagree with you on how Kai's side has been uh, like depicted because I don't want to argue to go as far as to argue that uh, he's the application of the Barra Barca approach to politics. But I think that most of his ideology was of his ideology or political position were created after he became popular and after he became a media person. In, in the West, we thought that this happened in October. Mm -hmm. He has been around for years in Tunis. Migalo started imitating him in 2013. A lot of teenagers knew him better than other people. So I think that he's actually the stereotype of a proper populist. And uh, I would see him more than as uh, like a Middle Eastern or North African politician. I would see him as a perfect member of the Five Stars movement in Italy, for instance. This idea that we are against everyone, we don't really have a real political agenda. We have some buzzwords every now and then, but... You said a perfect the, member? A perfect yeah, member. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, Linked to, to the consensus thing, I have the impression that in Tunisian politics, I, uh, the political ideologies do not exist anymore. Modernism is to a certain extent death. Uh, political Islam, we can discuss. And I have the impression that this, uh, this erosion is bringing m more the personalities to the forefront of politics rather than ideas and political agendas. So the scenario that I want you to react to is that the next presidential elections will be a fight between Abir Moussi and uh, the leader of Karama party, like uh, Makhlouf, because all 
the old political parties and ideologies have collapsed and because it's not very much about like proposing a, a coherent political message because i don't think i said propose anything like this i just think that it's about being the purest as possible against your enemies and these politicians are now working on this knowing that these ideologies have disappeared so so the Tea Party well, against the Democratic Socialists. Yeah, and then, like, also, if other members of <laughs> the panel want to react to um, this. And a second question right here, Monji. I don't think anybody, Dario, would understand the Barra Barca approach, <laughs> except maybe a few Tunisians. Sounds here. ominous to me. Uh, <laughs> the, my, my question actually is uh, with regards to the dark side of consensus, which, uh, which is a great piece, but I, I, I think... Um, to me, it, it, it failed of talking to us about w what is the alternative. I mean, what, what is the other options that Nahda or, or others who are seeking consensus that had to, to approach? I mean, we've tried the, the kind of the, uh, the, the typical uh, opposition or government versus the opposition side, but that led us to actually closing literally the parliament and and almost a collapse of the whole democratic transition 2013 which you know and the consensus didn't it was not for seven or eight years the consensus started in 2014 yeah the end of 2013 maybe unless but she's right about my, 2011. <laughs> my, my my question is also i think we uh, to to understand this need for nahda to to go after consensus and insist i think we need to look inside Nahda rather than outside Nahda. I think we, we your piece also, I didn't see that, uh, that it, it really examined who are the ones within the Nahda who are seeking consensus. Let's not forget that Nahda, at the beginning after the 2019 election, was not seeking consensus. Actually, they, they went to the revolutionary side, they tried their best, to create a government formed completely of four or five, you know, sides of what's called revolution against, you know, Qalb Tunis, and they said it specifically. They did not want Qalb Tunis in the government. Rajda Ghanoushi said it to come back a month later and s insisted that. I think the dynamics within Anahda is extremely important, uh, especially after um, you know Abdel Tif Al Makki when he said it for the first time in the media, and I think it went under the radar of many Western experts, that he said, I come from a different school than Rashid Ghanoushi. Meaning he's, diff he, he's talking totally different about another current within a Nahda, and that to be watched maybe in the 11th Congress. So that, that was the point of this panel. Carthage pack, good riddance, or if you don't have a Carthage pack, you're gonna have to reinvent a Carthage pack. Uh, and, I, and I'm not sh I think the jury's still out on that, and that's why this conversation is so valuable. A third question? More? No? Okay, so why don't we go with you first? Great. So let me. There's a question. Oh, so question in the back? Oh, I'm sorry, I missed it. Good. I have a question about foreign policy, Libya. How do you assess the Tunisian approach to the Libyan crisis, please? I'm happy to take that if no one else wants to, but um, uh, let's uh, start with you and the, and the, the um, second question. Great. So let me address both Monji's question as well as Marina that I didn't get to address last time, which is what is the alternative to consensus? Is majoritarian politics even possible? So if we look back to the coalitions after the 2011 revolution and after at elections as, as well as after the 2014 elections, in both cases there was a chance for a majoritarian government. So even in, in 20. 11, uh, Anahta and CPR alone would have been over 50%. Adding fourth place at the Qatul was an attempt to get a larger uh, consensus or unity government. Similarly, in, in 2014, Nida Tunis, uh, UPL, Efek mm -hmm. Tunis would have gotten just there to a 50 plus one. Yeah, uh, and you could have added, for instance, Mubadra, which yeah. would have been similar ideologically, or some independents who may have been similarly ideologically, uh, but they chose as well to have a broader national broader, unity yeah. government. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm not saying that the, in 2011, for instance, they shouldn't have, uh, but in 2015, there were some of these dark sides for extending consensus. Uh, but the calculations, uh, at the time, especially from Anatha getting to, to Munji's points, uh, was that not having a unity government, going back to that polarization, would have created 2013 once again, 
in the same way that Munji has, has uh, assessed here now. Uh, and what the other point we make in the paper is that whether or not that assessment is right, I don't know what the counterfactual would have been. Maybe it would have gone back to the same level of polarization. But the uh, fact that Anakta has made that assessment is it in itself revealing, because what it reveals is that democracy is not consolidated, uh, that there is this fundamental weakness in the transition, uh, which is that people are not willing to uh, repolarize, to take uh, differing political positions, and instead are insisting on national unity. That insistence on unity, we think, is a sign of the lack of democratic consolidation. So the other point we make uh, is just if consensus is continuing in Tunisia, that's actually a sign of democratic weakness as opposed to uh, strength. Mohamed Dia, Dario's scenario? Yes, uh, the, the ideology doesn't matter. And uh, how do you say? Barabarka. 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 This is actually the first time I hear it, even though I'm Tunisian. Um, so actually, I, if you're interested in, uh, in Qais Saeed, um, when he announced his... Uh, the current president, we should yes. say that. I, I built a long playlist on YouTube of his old videos going back to 2011. And since 2011, before the elections of 2011, he was, his views that he was ex he's expressing right now, he was expressing are the same. They didn't really change. So I don't think that this is something that is made up as in the in a, in a political, in an electoral context to satisfy the masses. No, there, he was a, a marginal voice in 2011. He has his idea he was if you talk to his student uh, they they he, they were introduced to his uh, to his uh, uh, project because it, it's uh, it's uh, it's an interesting one to think about um, so I wouldn't I don't think you can put him transpose him in the in, in the Italian context because uh, because of several factors there is uh, uh, if we talk about the the well, that's a huge box that I think you can put everyone who is not on the center. Uh, there is the, uh, like here, Bernie Sanders is a populist and Trump is a populist. And every, everyone, the, the only ones who are left who are those in the center. I don't think that uh, the word populist is analytically very useful to understand Qaisa Saeed's position. Uh, saying that he is... An anti-elite also is a misunderstanding of his own position because one, he is, if we go back to his lineage, which is something that is important. And by the way, when, when Maru was here, he called Aber Musi a populist. I mean, there's, pop, there's populism. Yeah, they it, use it, the expression yeah. that Shabawiya is used everywhere, but how much is it relevant? Yeah. Abir Musi is authoritarian. That's how we should call her. Yeah. Uh, so, but when it comes to the death of ideology and the importance of individuals, who is, for example, the one, the individual, the leader of Harak al Sha'a, for example, is it Jamal Abdel Nasser? He's not running, right? But it's a political party that embraces some of his ideas, and they are today an important political actor. They will be in the government. They will control important ministries, and they don't have a, 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 a leading political figure. Same thing uh, with uh, with the Tayar. The Tayar have several leaders. The maybe the most popular one is not uh, Mohammed Abu. It's his wife, Sami Abu, who who was in the polls in the before the election. She was one of the most popular f figures in the country, but she prefers working in the parliament. Uh, I don't think that even in in, in the Nahda, uh, Munji mentioned the importance of people like uh, uh, Abdul Tif al Makki uh, in the literature on on the on the Nahda. There is a whole group and a whole generation that is that is uh, marginalized and 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 today among the masses of uh, of uh, the, the voters of Nahda, they matter more sometimes than the Narasd Ghanoushi because of his abuse of consensus politics. So I don't think that we are in a situation where in populist leaders are the ones who are shaping the political uh, uh, seen in Tunisia, but I think ideas matter. And even when you follow the debate and you understand very well the historical background of each of them and where they were in the 80s, where, they're, where they were Islamists or they were in Ujet or they were in UGTU, uh, uh, you can analyze and see how much, uh, uh, um, how much ideology matters until today. Let me um, 
take a quick answer on the Libya question because we're almost at the end of our time and say that, first of all, if you don't know it already, Tunisia's fate depends on Libya and Libya's fate depends on Tunisia. And I could go on for another hour about that, but I'll stop there. I would also say that every North African country west of Libya took a useful point of view and just about every Arab country east of Libya took an unhelpful view. And it's the marriage of convenience between Tunisia, Algeria, and, and Morocco that's helped keep the UN process on track. Tunisia was a late invite to the Berlin yeah. process, um, but we've had a I've lot of it. really positive things going on in Tunisia and around Tunisia um, that have helped keep the possible positive outcomes for Libya on track, including, and they've helped with elections and other things too. Um, we're going to go to conclusion remarks. You want to add something? To yes. That? Yeah. Uh, also, Qais Saeed has, uh, he started his initiative in, in yeah. December. Uh, he, and he apparently he had also, he discussed the idea of working with more of what we conceptualize as the tribe of Libya. Uh, I mean, it's debatable, yeah. but also he discussed it with the with the new uh, Algerian president, and he mentioned it. So that's another approach that is being explored. So him not participating to the Berlin conference is not only about not being invited. There is other, uh, there is more to it, which is the way he sees what he defines for an intervention. What is for an intervention? So I think the alternative path that he's thinking about, we should maybe pay some attention and see if potentially it can help to approach the, the Libyan conflict from a different uh, way. So the Q&A uh, uh, session is over. I'd just like to offer each panelist one final thought, 20 or 30 seconds, if you have one. Sabina, do you have a final thought? Thanks. I don't. I'll just be very eager to see how things go forward. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sharon, a final thought? Leave it there as well. Okay, Daniel. Yeah, I do actually thought? have a final thought. And yeah. That is very simply that, you know, given the nature of how this system works, the president is, is very important, <laughs> ironically so, given the desire to empower the parliament. Yeah. And the Constitution accords, in a kind of symbolic language, enormous importance to the president, not just even though he's mostly there as the manager of security issues and foreign policies, he is pivotal. And, um, it's, and so the fact that, that this system is not able to sort of resolve it, and part of the current crisis in, in, in Tunisia has played out in the last year or two is sort of what precisely are the president's powers? How is he supposed yeah. to exercise them? And there's no resolution of that. Maybe we have to live with that. But and, and this it's, formal it's, and it's informal power. Yes, yeah. it's, and, and I think <laughs> we're seeing a, 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 the, the current president, you know, intervene in ways that, well, in some sense he has to. Yeah. So, you know, whether you judge that to be a cost or not is, you know, is a matter of judgment. The final thought? Oh, that's okay. I don't okay. Have, uh, so <laughs> fantastic audience. Great question. Thanks you all coming out. This is a great turnout for a Tunisia panel uh, other than right after an election. So thank you all for coming. <laughs> I hope the conversation continues and please come to our next event. There you go.